accomplish, Lord. Lord, we trust it, but it is powerful. And give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to his church this morning. Lord, we need you. Lord, I pray that we would encourage one another. And Lord, we expect you to work. So we're thankful for this book, this inspired and inert word that's sufficient for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's time to get ready. Have you ever heard that around your house? It's time to get ready. Let's go. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? If any of you has kids or maybe you that have husbands, uh, you say this a lot, right? Are you ready? Are you ready yet? You get ready for the ball game? Ready, guys? Let's go. Are you ready? Paul, in this text, talks about his ready heart uh, to go visit those in Rome. Okay? So let's read this text, and then let's get ready. Okay? Verses 8 to 15. We looked at verses 1 to 7 yet last week. This is God's word. Paul says this, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers asking that somehow by God's Will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Verse 12, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager, or I am ready, to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. This is God's word. This section of the beginning part, the end of the introduction here of Romans, we see in it Paul's ministry motivations, his intentions for what he's wanting to do. He wants to go see in person those that are at Rome. Uh, He longs for it. And he says here, so have you ever wanted, heard about something God was doing somewhere and longed to be there, to be part of it? You want to be where God is working. I, I know I'll hear about, I'll think that. Like when I hear about, uh, you know, what's purported of like a, an out, outbreaking or a outpouring of God's work somewhere or uh, a revival, so to speak. I'm like, man, I just want to go visit there. And, and, if, and if I could like drive to Kentucky and back in an afternoon, I, I probably would, right? Or, or something like that. You're like, okay, um, and you want to be there. Or when you hear about something going on, uh, one of your best friends or someone really close to you and they're having a, a wedding and they're getting married, you're like, I want to be there in person. I just don't want to watch it on Facebook, right? Uh, you want to be there or a ball game. You want to be there in person. Uh, maybe there's a monument or something going on. You just want to drive by there. And in this section of Scripture, we get to see the heartbeat of someone consumed by the gospel, someone who's dedicated. Paul says he's sanctified or set apart. Another way of looking at that is, is, is consecrated. We we'll even see him use another word uh, when we get to chapter 12. He's dedicated, that there's this sacrifice, this, this dedication to the gospel that consumes Paul's life. And so we get to see the heartbeat of someone who is consumed by the gospel. And so the heartbeat of someone who knows God through faith in Jesus Christ, and I hope that would be the majority of people here, that the heartbeat of those who would know God through faith in Jesus Christ is to make him known where he is not known. God's proper application of the benefit of the gospel is those that have, are yet to be reached. We mentioned how Paul's 
heartbeat here is he, so he's probably writing from Corinth. He's getting ready to take this gift back from the churches to, to Jerusalem, and he wants to go to this kind of central capital city church of Rome on his way to Spain. He tells us that when we get to chapter 15 and 16. So there's an application for us that the gospel came to you because it was on its way to somebody else. And the application of the benefit of those uh, the, to re- receive the gospel are still yet unreached. There's still work to do. Jesus said he would be building his church, and if he's not returned yet, he's still doing it. The job is yet, the commission is still going on. But the gospel is still relevant to those who are already believers. So he says, I want to go do this, but I also want to preach this gospel to you also who are in Rome. And remember, he's writing to these Christians, this church in Rome. And our problem is that we often lack the heartbeat of someone consumed by the gospel because our, our, our gospels often, our, our hearts are often consumed with something else. And we need to have a Christian worldview. And what that means is we need to think Christianly. Um, it's funny how uh, most of our job and ministry is Christianizing the Christian, right? Um, that think Christianly about everything. And that's very, very practical. Sometimes we'll see the book of Romans as this like theoretical doctrinal book. But when you say, okay, the worldview, how should a Christian respond to someone with a Buddhist view of God? What about someone who would have a position on a new age religion? How should we think about abortion? How does the gospel relate to homosexuality and even to environmentalism? Do you want to get practical? Go to the book of Romans. It's all there. So, Doug Moo said it this way. He says, what we badly need is solid ground in the Christian worldview. We need to know how to think Christianly about everything in our culture, not just about what's happened, what happened to have been taught. If we are to be prepared to respond to the array of religious options in our culture and to live consistent Christian lives, we must operate from this broad perspective of understanding the gospel. And this comes to us in the, gospel, in, in the book of Romans. Romans. Romans helps us with that. It's probably more, it more centralized in this, in this New Testament book than anywhere else. This is anything but boring. The lifestyle that grows out of a worldview that is central around the doctrine of the gospel is what we see in Paul. And that can be the same way for you. So the last couple of weeks, we've seen the influence that Romans has had um, throughout the age of the church. We saw that with Augustine, with Luther, and Wesley. We saw that in Paul and his conversion. And we, saw, we talked about the situation with the Jews. There are probably lay folks that were in Pentecost that have gone back to Rome. There's this church that's growing. During this time, Claudius expels the Jews, so there's a primary Gentile uh, makeup. And then when Nero comes, becomes the emperor, he allows the Jews to come back to Rome. So there's this tension culturally but in the church. And um, so Paul is both, um, both trying to deal with this pastoral problem, but also focus on this mission to get the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, and so understanding Romans helps us with a lot of this. Um, one author said, big things happen when we understand Romans. And the common denominator in all of that for Paul is this mission that he has to, to get the gospel to Spain. So Paul introduced himself. He interrupts that introduction to give this heavy gospel explanation, this gospel that defines Paul. He's connected to it. But then when he finishes this out, the themes that we see in verses 8 to 15 is that of thanksgiving and prayer. But I want to take those themes that we see there and see it. And I think exegetically we can see that the example of Paul here is something we don't always look at examples and emulate. And obviously you have to be careful because he is an apostle and that's a one-time thing. But there is something that we could say, hey, there's an example to follow here in Paul of his heartbeat. So this heart of someone consumed, dedicated, consecrated to the gospel And we want to learn from Paul's example. So when he says, I'm ready or I'm eager to to come bring the gospel, that we would have that same 
ready heart. So let's get ready to see what that heart looks like. Verse 8, the first thing I want to point out about this heart that is consumed with the gospel. It is a heart of gratitude expressed. He is expressing gratitude. He actually says here, first. Now, if you're a good reader, when you see first, you're looking for second somewhere else, and you're not going to find it uh, in this section. So so we kind of conclude by that, that Paul is saying, hey, this is of first importance, like first, like this is an important thing, but I want to say this first of all, He says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. So he expresses gratitude for the work of grace in the lives of others. This is a common feature in Paul's life. He does this in the beginning of 1 Corinthians, in Philippians, in 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Timothy, in Philemon. He's almost looking for it. And I want to encourage us to look for God's grace in somebody else's life. Like to see like a glimmer of hope. Look for that, uh, how God's grown them and encourage them. Because it's not, it's not flattery to tell someone something's not true, but it is um, something that you would affirm in them. Hey, God is changing you. God's grown you. And Paul is doing that. There, he's grateful in all the world, all the spoken world, this news had spread throughout the empire, the presence that there are Christians in the capital city. That's an incredible thing that we don't want to miss out on that, that, whoa, we're hearing stories about there are Christians in the capital city. There are Christians in Rome. (coughs) And it's very fitting that he says, I give thanks. That word is the word Eucharisto, where we get the word Eucharist, and we think of our thanksgiving to God, when a eulogy, a good, thankful word for someone who's passed on. When we celebrate the table, we're expressing that thanks to God for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. So he is thankful. The heart of response to the gospel is a grateful heart. And then he ensures them that he's praying for them. He's establishing rapport, letting them know, hey, we're praying for you. And then he says, I hope to visit you in person. Now, something interesting he says in verse 9, I want you to look at it. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. What does that mean? This phrase is used in a wider sense to point to Paul's wholehearted service, this consumed heart in the gospel. this, This gospel, he says, in this gospel of his son. He's, remember, he's going back to this kind of big God, and he had talked to us about this in verses 3 and 4. The gospel, verse 2, which was promised beforehand. This big God theology, it's a gospel of God. And so he's, he's, he's going back over this. He's rooting everything in this gospel. He'd established his apostolic authority, but this God-centered, the gospel is about God, the gospel of God. God and Paul makes this a fundamental thing of the gospel and he says in verse 3 it is concerning his son it is centered around Jesus uh, who he is what he's done in our place and this promise that it was this seed descended from David his resurrection the gospel's rooted in promise that's what accepting the gospel is is believing the promise, receiving the promise, and it's all of grace. Salvation is for those that are weak, not for those that are strong. And this gospel brings about this obedience, and his motive for this is for the sake of the name. The gospel, he wants it to go for the sake of the name to all peoples. It's centered in God. So I hope we would have a thankful heart a full heart in the gospel to, hey, look what God's doing in other people. So this heart is expressed in gratitude. The next, second point I want to put about Paul's heart consumed with the gospel that we would follow. It is verses 11 and 12, a heart to give encouragement. A heart that gives encouragement. Let's look at it together. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. What does that mean? This is actually the first time we see in the Bible, if you were reading through the Bible, spiritual gift. What does that mean? He says, I want to impart to you some spiritual gift. 
I wrestled with that a lot this week. In fact, some of my favorite authors disagreed, and I was really struggling by that, and, I, and there was even some footnote battles going on between people that thought it was uh, an expression, a gift, or one of the actual spiritual gifts. And um, so, so uh, I'm going to let Pastor George d- d- uh, tell you what it really means, okay? Um, no, he, here's what I think, okay? He, he, I don't think he's talking about the specific spiritual gifts of that he's going to come give you this gift. Like, I'm going to come dub this person with prophecy or administration or helps or fellowship. But that what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to give one of his gifts— like something, how he serves. I want to come and give that gift to you. I want to come and serve you. I want to come, I want to come express that. And I think what that gift is, is his teaching and preaching the gospel. That he's, he says, I want to come give you some spiritual gift that so to strengthen you. And so Paul wants to go to use one of his spiritual gifts. Now, Speaking of spiritual gifts, we, we talk a little bit about this in the new member class of how part of the role of being part of a church is to expressing your gifts in the, in the church. And sometimes there, we got to get hung up on what your gift is or what combination of gifts you have and taking quizzes and tests and things like that to determine one's spiritual gifts. But I think, or which ones are still operating in what ways today, you know, like tongues or something like that. We talk about that. But one of the things I want you to note about here that we can learn about spiritual gifts here from Paul's example is that spiritual gifts are used to strengthen others. He says, I want to come impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. We see the same thing in 1 Corinthians 12 when he says, I'm doing this for the mutual building up of the church. I'm building this up for the prophet with all. This, this is what the purpose of gifts are. Gifts are given so that we can use them to strengthen others. It's a gift of faith from God to us that we use to strengthen the faith of others. So, let me just tell you, every Christian, if you're a believer here, you have been gifted by the Spirit in some way to serve. And the purpose of it is to build up and strengthen the faith of brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why why, why you have that. And my encouragement to you, rather than spending all afternoon taking spiritual gifts surveys and quizzes, is just to serve when there are opportunities and let God figure it out. And you will find you're like, oh, they, uh, I, I saw someone and they seemed like this, so I offered to say, hey, can I bring you some soup or something like that? And then they're, they're that, how, talk about how that was encouraging to them and you got such joy out of it. And you, and you might not even realize, man, you have the gift of hospitality or you love helping organize stuff or serve something. You got to fix some, help someone when they were broken down or something or however that might be, or organizing or teaching. And, and someone's like, hey, we need someone to fill in with the Olympian kids on this night. Could you? And then you're, you're just like thrilled by it even though you were so nervous about it. And you're like, and but you just serve when their needs come up and how the Lord leads and he open that up because let me tell you gifts are given to us so that we can strengthen others I hope this thought just is a very fundamental thing about spiritual gifts that I think will change the way you view gathering for church that one of the purposes for gathering together as God's people is not for you to listen and watch and observe but for you to partake and participate that we come this is what he, he, the writer of Hebrews says don't forsake the assembling yourselves together. But right before, he's saying that you're supposed to come together so you can exhort one another, to encourage one another. If you come with that idea that I want to strengthen somebody else's faith, I totally get that the biggest blessing that some people will get out of today's gathering as a church is not going to be this sermon. It's going to be someone talking to you in the lobby afterwards, giving you a hug and say, how's this going? Or here's, how, here's something God used in my life in that area when I was going through that. And you, there's that encouragement that goes on. That is so big. So those gifts are given to you not for you to hoard. To say, well, this is my gift. I do this. It's for you to strengthen others. And when you have fruit of the Spirit of a gift, when you hoard fruit and don't use it, it ends up rotting. This happens to us almost every week. There's that fine line with bananas when they're too green to eat and when they're too rotten to eat. And there's that perfect time you got to get them, right? And, and if it just sits there too long, it's going to rot. 
And there are some folks that have been letting your gifts just sit in the seat. Don't let it rot. Next week, there'll be an announcement about VBS volunteering. And yeah, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm teasing, maybe. Um, so no, so use your gift. Don't let it just spoil. Another application of this for spiritual gifts when we are looking for officers in a church thinking if someone has a skill set is not the criteria the criteria is they're, if they're, they're wanting to strengthen and exhorting the, the, the faith of others and grow in serving God's church um, Tim Keller said of this verse that teaches us to use whatever gifts the Lord has graciously given us to make others stronger in their faith do you see that as a purpose of your spiritual gifts? Now, he doesn't just want to come do this. He says, there's the next phrase. He says, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine, verse 12 says. Paul wanted to encourage them, and Paul said he needed to be encouraged by them. I want you to think about that. This is Paul. These people have not been discipled. They've not been schooled. They've not had these Damascus Road experiences. They haven't even written, read the New Testament yet, especially the book of Romans. They've never even read the book of Romans, right? Um, we don't know what scriptures they have, but Paul says that he needs them to encourage him. Do you see that mindset in yourself towards church life? That, you know what, I need this church as much as, this church, as, as, much as I need to be here. That we need this mutually en encouragement. This, when you come, I'm, I'm just saying, you will totally change the way you view the gathering of God's people if you think of what you can give rather than what you can get. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about you giving and exercising your spiritual gifts. You say, well, I'm not on the music schedule that week. Talking to somebody. And well, I'm not teaching that week talking to it, there, you know most of the expressing of the spiritual gifts happens in the one anothering before and after the service the phone calls the conversations the lunch meetings the coffee the tea the whatever it is you drink um between you know meals and everything like that. that's where a much of this mutually encouraging happens so don't see this gathering as a consumer how can i use my gifts I want to impart this. I want to encourage and be encouraged. Paul's not saying, he's, I want to come and be encouraged by you. He's not saying, you know, do they have, you know, whatever blank program you want to have to meet our family's needs. Um, and, and we don't want to, and it betrays a mindset that we see church as a production. Well, you know, the music wasn't to my liking. Or was the sermon enjoyable? And usually, depending on your style and preachers, and I have my favorite preachers too, and I have my taste, either that means emotionally moving and encouraging for some people, or educational and engaging for other people. And so there's, but Paul's not doing either of that. He's not writing the church in Rome and saying, hey, I have this thorn in the flesh. Do you guys have a thorn in the flesh support group that I could come be part of? I don't know if I can come there because you don't have the, re the Pharisee recovery program that I really need because a former Pharisee here, you know, you do have that program for me. He's saying, I want to come be encouraging to you and I need to be encouraged by you. And if you follow his example of this mindset, it would do us all good. Point number three, verse 13. So this heart of expressing gratitude, a heart of giving encouragement and a heart of gospel expectancy he says i he wants to visit them he says that i do not want you to be unaware brothers that if i that i have often intended to come to you but thus far as i've been prevented in order that i may reap some harvest among you as well as the rest of the gentiles he wants to do this. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. I am eager, I am ready to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. This is, he's really getting to the purpose of his visit, to make them strong. He believed that his explanation of the gospel, when understood correctly, would make their faith strong. And 
explaining the gospel and and helping people understand it will make all of our faith strong so he has this obligation this is the fourth thing he is this heart of obligation of evangelism obligation he is obligated to preach to them and he says the greek and the barbarian that phrase uh, is used by greeks in the classical and the hellenistic period to talk about people less cultured than themselves um, and included em- enemies like persians and, and egyptian <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. In the Roman period of Greek use, it referred to the Spanish, the Gauls, and the Germans. And we call them the barbarians. And he says, I owe a debt. I'm a debtor, both to, both to the Jew and to the Greek. He has an obligation and I often wonder, how does he owe them anything? You know, we'll often say when we talk about boundaries, I don't owe them anything. Usually, when we're in debt because we owe someone something because we borrowed something from them. He's like, he didn't borrow anything from them. Paul hadn't borrowed anything from them, but God had freely given grace to Paul. He'd also given this apostleship, this sending, this purpose of being separated to the gospel to Paul. You've received grace. You can't pay that back. Now, we're not dead, like, as far as we can't, there's no way we can pay God back, right? Jesus paid it all. But we are debtors because of receiving that grace to others who need that grace like us. Um, there's this sense of obligation that I owe it to them to give them the gospel. Do you have that sense of obligation that you owe it to them to give them the gospel? I hope you do. I hope there are loved ones and family members and there. And I'm not. Ta- I'm not saying you need to go to work tomorrow and get the biggest Bible ever, four inches. And see your coworker that you've been sitting next to for 20 years and smack him upside the head this and say, turn or burn, you know? You know? I'm not saying that. But listen, if you've been sitting next to that person for 20 years and you've never gotten there, you need to take some steps. Um, I remember a couple years ago when people were saying, I'm wearing this because I want to love my neighbor. I want to love my neighbor. And I get that. There's a heart. But then I used to think, wait. If you love your neighbor, putting something on your face, when you haven't told them that their soul is going to hell if they don't believe on Jesus, do you really love your neighbor? Like, there's a big difference here. That There should be a sense of obligation, of sharing the gospel, of going there, taking steps to being intentional with it. Um. And may God give you grace and and courage and boldness. Paul, regularly, they pray for boldness to share the gospel um, with our kids, with our grandkids, with our neighbors. Being wise to go there, do you owe it to them? Do you feel that sense of obligation to share the gospel with them? The heartbeat of those who know Christ is going to be one who wants to make him known to others to know him and what to make him known the gospel's proper application is that it's coming to us on its way to somebody else it's to benefit those who are still unreached said this at the beginning the gospel is also our daily food for every human heart so he's going and saying hey i want to get this gospel to spain but i'm eager to preach it to you also who are in rome even though the, those of you that know and believe on Christ because it strengthens you. Tell me the old, old story. I need to hear it again. I, I love to hear the story. It, it, for those who know it best, I mean, we, we, we need to hear the, the story. We need to have the gospel preached to ourselves all the time because our, our hearts are always going back to default, to wanting to add to our own salvation, wanting to earn our own God, opinion with God based on our performance, how we did today, how we, whether we read our Bible or not enough this week, whether we were, whether we were nice to the dog or the neighbor kid or we're not or whether we like you know whatever it is 
We need to preach that my standing before God is not in who I am, but what he's done. And we all need that encouragement of the gospel. So the heartbeat of those who know God through faith in Jesus Christ is going to be to make him known. That, that is Paul's example. So what are you living for? What Paul's living for is this. There, there, there are, there are, to further the cause of Christ in the world and to do good to those that are around them. To further this cause and to encourage those around them. What are you living for? You have, if God has you here, you have a purpose. And it fits into one of those two categories. To further God's purpose in the world, to reach, to get the gospel to people, and to encourage those that he has here. You can do that. So, Paul has a readiness to preach the gospel. He is ready to be thankful. He is ready to use his gift to strengthen others. He is ready to share the gospel. So what if I were to go around this room and say, are you ready? Are, do you have a ready heart like Paul does here? Are you ready? What are you living for? And if you're not, let's get ready. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the word. We're thankful for Paul's example here. Lord, would you give us ready hearts? Lord, we're grateful for your work in other people's lives. Lord, give us a heart to use our gifts to encourage others around us. Lord, and would you burden us with the debt of the obligation we have to share the gospel with somebody. Lord, there are people that are in our spheres, our family, our work, our neighbors, that we may be the only opportunity, the only person that will ever share Christ with them. There is a debt that we owe to the gospel, to Christ's heart, to share it with them. Lord, would you give us 